I look forward to hearing from our features today who come as, in a way, uh, groups who collaborate with each other in different ways and bounce ideas off each other and make things happen uh, in the spirit of the arts and are also gifted at what they create as well. I heard, I had the good fortune to hear this lineup of poets this summer in Maine, the Henry Street Poets. And I'm happy that they could be here today from all different directions. I'm Susan Jo Russell, and um, I'll, I'll start with um, a poem from my chapbook. Um, so this first poem is from a childhood job I had, um, which was to pick beetles off my mother's climbing rose for a penny a beetle. It's called 129 Dead Japanese Beetles. <laughs> Careful of the thorns, arms stretched up along the chimney brick, she plucks the vandals off her mother's roses. They don't come off easy. Sticky legs cling to red velvet, squirm against her fingers as she drops them in the water. They don't die easy, either. They buzz and scratch and crash against the glass, making rafts of each other desperate for flight. A few escape. Scrupulous, she subtracts them. A dollar, a quarter, four pennies, enough for some treasure to redeem the rest of the muggy August afternoon. She walks to the five and dime, counting her steps. While rivulets of sweat roll down her spine, she thinks about the pile of shiny beetlebacks she chucked under the forsythia, wonders if any ledger keeps track of such little deaths. Hi, I'm Jim Henley. Uh, thank you, Cheryl, for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, this is a poem about connection. Uh, the, the Irish poet Seamus Heaney just died, uh, a tremendous loss for the world of poetry for everyone. And uh, I went to a memorial about uh, a couple weeks ago, and um, I wrote this afterwards. Fall's first chill night finally has shaken me from summer's numb comfort, where flesh became itself and forgot its polar sense, its gleanings, its land's end. And tonight, a sliver of the last moon slow, sows a cloak of darkness and sheds its drifts of white powder, its dream, its martyrology. How long have I been concussed by daily life? It's too cold, this awakening. A whirl of the earth, a throw of the bones, Seamus, why are you not writing poems anymore? Hello, I'm Mary Ellen Gear from Acton. I'm delighted to be here along with the rest of the Henry Street Poets. I'm going to open with a poem from my chapbook. It's uh, set in the sculpture park of the decor of a museum in Lincoln, which some of you may have been to. It's a beautiful place on top of a hill overlooking a lake, and there are extensive grounds with sculptures scattered around among the trees, some of them very large. This is about what the park looked like in the aftermath of a big windstorm. It's called De Cordova Sculpture Park, Early March. The giant bronze Buddha head listens for the world tones with his huge ear, but the ground is still too hard he can hear no vibrations. The only sound is the wind gusting in off the lake. That same wind has blown Eve's apple right off her hand. It rolls down the hill, comes to rest against the feet of the dancer with the cracked glass skirt who tilts sideways. The three tall spears made of flashing steel that rise and fall in perpetual motion can't reach the vertical they're straining for. The wind beats them down, and they point in all directions at once. Farther down the hill, an enormous pine is uprooted. 
Under it lies a big wooden barrel-shaped pink pig, stove down the middle, curved boards broken open like the peels of an orange, a branch poking through its eye. Do they know the world is off balance? I think they must. They feel the unease. They've absorbed it through their roots like trees. The Buddha head listens and listens again for the world tones, still too faint for him to hear. Hi, I'm Oliver Payne. I'm the token Mainer in the group from Kennebunk. And I also like, would like to thank Cheryl for inviting us today. My uh, first poem is titled Climbing the Walls. And like Susan Joes, it, it does have an insect, although not featured as prominently as in hers. Climbing the Walls. I never understood what people meant by this till I broke my leg while limping to the end of a marriage and couldn't even climb stairs, much less walls, something I'd always wished I could do ever since watching Fred Astaire in royal wedding dance up one wall across the ceiling and down the other side of a small room, fooling with the lights and chairs en route. Then behold a photo of his new love and sigh as if they were dancing a waltz, just a one, two, three to eternal love. And though the illusion was undercut by the actress being Winston Churchill's daughter, Sarah, her looks gone haggard from drink, and the shot was just a mechanical trick of tumbling the camera and room. The timing of his moves in gravity's shifts from one plane to the next still makes you wonder, how do he do that? Just as a stink bug, climbing the sheer wall of my window leaves me too awestruck to squish it and let it earn its name. Can you do that? I want to ask someone I sense kibitzing over my shoulder. But when I turn for her answer, she's gone. OK, so this is the round where we're going to um, each read a few, a few poems. Um, so I'll read one more from the chapbook. Um, which there are copies of here. Um, the, it's called We Are Not Entirely Abandoned, the chapbook. And um, the middle section uh, uh, is a long poem based on the letters that my father wrote to my mother during World War II when he was stationed in Okinawa, which I'm lucky to have. Um, but that's too long to read. Um, so I will read, um, however, a short one uh, that's, that is a, a memory of my father. It's called, uh, hearing cards shuffled on the train from New York to Boston. Hearing cards shuffled on the train from New York to Boston. When I was eight, I learned from you the feel of the stiff edges letting go. My card-sized hands fumbled, thumbs struggled for control, but I practiced and I grew. I remember the intake of breath and the slow peek at a brand new hand, the anything can happen of drawing a card from the deck, the exquisite moment of pretense before announcing, go, fish. And one day I did it, like a professional, you said, falling one by one, gathering speed like wings of hummingbirds, a perfect interlocking blur. I hear it again, a few seats ahead. It might be anyone. It might be you, close in the rattling night, dealing a hand or two. Um, and I'll read a couple of new, newer poems. Uh, this one is called um, Picking Up a Leaf on the Way Home After a Not Very Pleasant Day at Work. It is not possible to explain how, just now, the weight of one sycamore leaf steadies me. What turns out to matter is ordinary, frail. It smells of mottled bark, of the work of turning into itself. I trace its fine, jagged teeth, feel its crush and crinkle in my palm like the snake's shed skin 
like the beginnings of dirt. I rubbed the fragments on my cheek, let them fall. Scattered yellow on the sidewalk, they will not be again. Not these particular leaves, not this particular scattering. So I don't know um, how many of you use this trick of anticipating future events um, by pretending they've already happened. So as if we rehearse them enough, they won't be so bad when they actually happen. Um, and I, as I get older, I find myself doing this even more. And um, this poem is called Practice, Practice. I rehearse, pretending one death or another. I practice yours in the slow, dark mornings half asleep or during a rainstorm that comes up without warning, trembling the panes. You could be a few miles away or not, a few hours until I see you or not. After the rain, I invent errands to go out into noon's palpable light where I chant my secular incantations. The sun consumes itself, but it has longer. Billions, they say, still almost half gone. Uh, and I think that's about my time, so thank you. I'm going to read a couple of poems about childhood, uh, one of them about mine, and one of them not. And uh, this first one is not, and it takes place in uh, a park in Paris called the Butte Chaumont, which is actually a famous park. The Surrealists liked it a lot, but so did I. Um, it's called At, At the Butte Chaumont. The carousel tucked in the garden slope like a vase in a child's arm and Leela, at three, steps up to ride with an air of glory and a slight dizziness, like a charm, to lean her toward her brusque and loving papa. The slightest rain to be out from under. Music pumps, and she swings once, twice, and three times, whirling past papa, past her uncles with their cigarettes and solaces, dressed drab like drizzly, drizzly January. Here's the, here the world is just beginning. They let her grab the dancing flail for a free ride, and when she's done, and she astride his neck, the men turn like horses for the cafe, and she sings, in the sky, in my palm, little bird, where do you belong? She and the three men who walk in silence to the swift, hissed traffic, thinking of recent women, and restless in the rain. And uh, this is a poem from my uh, childhood. Uh, it, since we're in the Civil War, tercentennial? What is it? Sesquicentennial. Um, I thought I would uh, read this. It's about um, seeing my brother be Abraham Lincoln. It's called Will Little Remember. My mother made the beard from cotton dipped in India ink and strung along a black wire coat hanger like popcorn on the Christmas tree and hooked around his ears. The costume came from somewhere else, prop department, angel school, complete with stovepipe hat and the dignity of tails, which I imagined only animals knew. Land of the pilgrim's pride of thee I sing to the humble clank of pumpkin cans chosen like fishermen of Galilee for devotion to the unknown poor. And then the muffled colors and voices gave way to the focal stage. My lone and older brother John, a lanky Lincoln, three years past his log cabin days of polio, and whose prodigious memory began four score and seven years ago. And he gestured as he never did as John, while the sonorous text declared its antique promise. I peered at the stage boards and the ropes, and my brother was a captain of a prodigious ship, and his words were prow, spreading the waters. But the Union dead were given only two minutes of thanksgiving in 1958, 
So the great velvet curtain began to close, and my brother's friend, Jimmy Huntington, a descendant of a signer of the Declaration of Independence, no less, in some right of precedence, grabbed Mr. Lincoln from off stage by the black padded shoulders and flung him behind the curtain long before and shall not perish from the earth. My brother's outstretched hand was the last I saw as the cat curtain closed upon his dignity overwhelmed. Six Semper Tyrannus, I suppose, but it was the only time I saw Lincoln in the flesh. <laughs> I'm going to read another poem from my chapbook, which is called Life After Life. This is a poem about a house, the kind of house that you maybe drive past every day, and you start to fall in love with the house and wonder what it would be like to live there. It's called Yellow House. Every day I drive past it, and that yellow calls out to me. It's a small house, all by itself at the top of a gentle rise overlooking Potter's Hill Road and the meadow beyond. The roof line is starting to waver a little, and the grass is growing wild between the stones of the walk. I know just how it would feel to live in that house. I'd sleep with you in the upstairs front room, listening to the wind blow through the meadow grass, keeping warm together on winter nights as the furnace whirs and groans the mice scrabble in the attic. We would discover its secrets, the hidden river that flows underneath, bearing away the joys and sorrows of all who have lived here, the poems written on the wallpaper in faded ink. Our children would grow up here, the two of them running wild in the fields, picking berries, building whole villages of twigs and mud, learning to speak the forgotten language of moles. Years later, we're still there, you and I, and the house knows everything about us. The way we like to eat dinner at the round table in the kitchen, books propped up on our coffee mugs. The way we quarrel and the way we forgive. The way we keep wondering which one of us will go first. The grass on the walk is long again pushing up between the stones, a tangle of tough stalks wrapped around tender green shoots, like our hearts. I'm going to end with a poem that's based on something that actually happened about 20 years ago, which involves rubber ducks. Um, a cargo ship was en route from Hong Kong to San Francisco with a shipment of many things, and among them were many crates of bathtub toys. And in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, a couple of these crates fell off and broke open, and one of them had 28,000 rubber ducks in it. <laughs> and the rubber ducks, a year or two later, started coming ashore in all kinds of places, in California, and Alaska, and even in Australia. And scientists began keeping track of this because they realized it would tell them a lot about the movement of ocean currents, depending on where the ducks ended up. Um, but in my poem, I'm interested not so much in the ocean currents, but in what this, this journey of the rubber ducks might have been like. It's called Voyage. Destined for bathtubs, they found themselves in open seas, heading north. At first, enjoying their unexpected freedom, bobbing and dipping in the waves, but then losing heart when they saw what lay ahead. The Bering Strait the towering icebergs, the cold. Trapped for several years by slow-moving Arctic ice, they made no headway. The weaker members of the fleet cracked and broke, their yellow rubber backs crazed with fault lines, their painted eyes erased. Then a hardy band made it through to the North Atlantic's safer waters. Soon they'll fetch up on the tame New England coast. Already they're dreaming of the friendly fishing village, the pines, the brightly colored boats. Isn't that what it's like? The journey, the waiting, the loneliness, the loss of friends, 
but always the hope that in the end, you'll find safe harbor. Thank you. My next poem is, is called uh, So Long You Loved Windows, which is probably not very appropriate for down here, but anyway. So long you loved windows, trusted conveyance between seer and seen. Once you crawled, you've been told, out an open window just above your crib to examine more closely the sky. But now you tremble to walk into well-windowed rooms. You wonder, will you see rail yard scars or the loneliness of high blue sky? You don't really care. Either will do and neither will do. In the end, they'll both make you cry. So long now, looking out windows, you've become wise to their tricks, how they promise the world, package up unruly landscapes and the unsuspecting crowds into a neat, clear box. But when you go to open it, it's never the same inside. The way dreams can seem to leave your mind, but never survive the waking intact. On a little bit lighter note, this one is called At the End of the Evening. At the end of the evening, your first time walking her home, the archaic pleasure of her orchid hand in yours, her laugh shivering her hair as corn silk shivers when the ear is shucked, and the pattern of her stockings spelling out love in a private codex you alone share. The old math conundrum comes to your mind about walking halfway there, then half the remaining half, and so on, always half a new distance to go, never quite arriving, never quite ending, this evening you hope, so may something begin. And uh, the next one is um, called My Heart. My Heart, a used wine cask, hollow, oak hard, tannic, longing for the filling and flowing again. A seized up motor into which acid's been poured where the oil should have gone. A hoar-frosted roast in the back of the freezer, expired muscle, not worth the thawing. A monk's begging bowl at dawn, please, love, leave a little rice, a few shreds of fish. And uh, this poem is um, called Why I Hate Working at the Bon Appetit, which is a, um, a place in Biddeford, Maine, the next town up from where I live in Kennebunk. Why I Hate Working at the Bon Appetit. Because the name's pretentious and perfect in a francophone town. Because good appetite is the only thing they don't lack. Because a soup kitchen is needed at all. Because we call them clients. Because they've been called much worse. Because we keep wait them waiting outside the church. Because I understand why. Because we hold the food back till precisely 4.45 because it's the fairest way for the greatest number, because the number is so great. Because we serve white bread, surplus cheese, cardboard greens, because they eat it up, because it smells so good when I'm hungry too. Because they smile, because they thank me, because they call me sir, and deep down I believe it's do. Because I can't imagine where they go next on a 10 degree night, because I can because I would never think of taking them in. Because I bathe in their warm gratitude as I put down my apron. Because they haven't the faintest idea. Because they do, but pretend they don't. And uh, last I'll read um, some haiku called Haiku for Fall. One, party. My feeder, suet, seeds, RSVP, only squirrels show. <laughs> Two, 
Bees have built their hives 14 feet up the tree trunks. Deep snows are coming. Three, first frost has whitewashed all the lawn but one patch. There the septic tank stews. <laughs> Four, arched under wet snow, saplings look graceful but fret. We must grow thick, quick. Five, twilight, cold, anxious, till I hear driveway music, firewood marimba. And six, by the deers and trails, they've left no empty beer cans, no longer sport, food. Thank you all. We all have at least one aunt who makes everyone's day sunny. For me, it is my Aunt Tilly who can be very, very funny. One day in January on a cold, blustery morn, Tilly's car stalled on a narrow road and the driver behind her blew his horn. But my aunt couldn't start her car. It became a sticky situation as the impatient driver behind her blew his horn without cessation. Tilly tried everything she could, but her car would not budge. I feel John's voice coming now. <laughs> the other driver kept blowing his horn. It was all just too much. So on, Tilly went to the other driver and said, I have a favor to ask of you. Could you please start my car for me while I sit in your car and blow your horn for you? <laughs> John Mylott, heal well. <laughs>